Okay, uh, so uh, welcome again to today's webinar. So uh, the voice that's going into your ears then is, is me. I'm Jo Wathen. Uh, I work at the UK Data Service uh, as part of the user support and training team. Uh, I'm a, I'm a long-term user of, of the Labour Force Survey, more, more a while ago than, than these days, uh, to be honest. But um, uh, I did my own PhD using the Labour Force Survey. I've shadowed uh, Labour Force Survey interviewers, and I've been a respondent to the Labour Force Survey. So I've, I've got a, a soft spot for this survey, and I, I really like being able to talk to people about it. Um, what we'll be covering is we're going to touch on a quick intro to the Labour Force Survey. I'm going to say a bit about why you might use the, labor, uh, the micro data, and I'll explain what I mean by that. Um, a little bit about some of the key issues you're likely to come across in analysis, uh, and then hopefully we'll have a time to do a little bit of a demo and, and show you uh, what this means in, in real life. So uh, as a bit about me, I, I quite, I'm quite interested to know who you are. So if you can launch that. Okay, that's just about a third of you voted. Okay, I'm going to close that in just three, two, brilliant, you're all voted. So but we've got a mixed bag. Uh, so we've got a few of you who've used microdata before. You, you may find some of, this, some of this quite introductory, but um, um, I hope you find something of use. And if uh, if you if you just want to jump to asking questions later, that's fine. Um, mixed people who've had some experience either of using individual level data or who have uh, come across the labour force survey, and, and a bunch of you who've not who've not come across either the labour force survey or or, or, or data like it. Um, we're, we're assuming very little today, but we have to start from somewhere, so I'm, I'm going to start with some sort of fairly basic principles, and um, if we can move on. So the Labour Force Survey, then, is a specialist survey. It uh, specializes, as the name suggests, in employment and training. The requirement to collect data like the data before survey is, is a requirement that's right across the EU. It's actually a, a requirement of the Treaty of Rome that set up the EU. So we've been running a survey like this since the early 1970s at the time that we joined. Now, uh, that doesn't mean that the stuff that's in the Labour Force Survey is solely to, to perform that role. And, and our Labour Force Survey is actually a, a bit bigger than most other countries. In the UK, it's a large survey. So by large, I mean that it contains information uh, from about 100,000 people who are living in 41,000 households. And it's a household survey, so it's, it's just those private households that uh, uh, information is gathered from, which is fairly ordinary, fairly standard for a, a survey. Um, but there is an exception, which is the, also that a sample of, of uh, halls of residence are included because of the importance of capturing information about young people. It's continuous, so interviewing is going on all year round. But it's also quarterly, so it's organized on a quarterly basis. So all the way through a quarter, people are asked questions, and then the next quarter, they will return to you and ask you questions again. So information is collected on a quarterly basis. It's produced, the results are produced on a quarterly basis. Data are available for quarterly basis, but it's actually going on all year round. It's conducted by the Office for National Statistics in Great Britain and uh, the survey unit in uh, the Northern Ireland Statistics um, Research Agency. So uh, one thing to note is it's, it's not collected by us. So we're the guys who look after data, make data available for reuse, but we're not the people who collect it. So we have a, a degree of expertise here and we're able to buffer questions. But if we get something that's really technical, then we, we go back to the people who created the data ourselves. So the way that it's done is that uh, it's done by a face-to-face -face interview first time round. Now, by first time round, I mean that if you look at, uh, look at this diagram here, and if we look at uh, January to March, that's what that JM means, uh, quarterly, remember, as opposed to April to June, July to September, and so forth. Um, so if we look at January to March in 2010, 
we'll find that there are people who've come in for the first time on their first wave in the study. But there are also people who were interviewed last wave, last quarter, and are now on their second turnaround, their third turnaround, their fourth turnaround, and their final turnaround. So those people who are interviewed the second to the fifth time, by and large, are contacted by telephone, as has been agreed when they're interviewed the first time, but first time, it's face to face. There is an exception. If you live in the far north of Scotland, they're probably going to phone you at the first time because people live a long way away and it's difficult to do face to face. Now, that means that any individual cohort will be in five times. So they, if they start in January, March in one year, they'll end in January to March for the next year. Proxy responses are accepted, by which I mean if you are out, then somebody else in the household may be asked to answer questions on your behalf. And that's applicable for about a third of cases in the data. The Labour Force survey outputs come in, uh, in a range of formats. So the statistics may either be statistics that are produced for the, Europe for the European Union by Eurostat, or in the UK, our local statistics, if you can call them that, are reported in something that's called the Labour Market Statistical Bulletin. So if you're after those headline numbers that you'll see reported in the news, that might be the place to look for them. If you're after statistics, but you're after statistics at the local level, then the place for you might be NOMIS. NOMIS is an online system designed for for delivering local statistics. Um, it's it's uh, done jointly with, through a university and the Office for National Statistics, and you'll find that you'll be able to download tables using wizards or, or in bulk um, using that. But those are all aggregate summary statistics that are produced. What I'm going to be focusing on in this session is the microdata. So the microdata are the individual files, so the files that contain individual records that are anonymous, and we have a range of different flavors of that. So there are individual level files that are uh, available for the quarters. There are uh, files that are done for every other quarter, but which link household members together. So that's not true for the quarterly individual file, but the quarterly household file still contains information about individuals, but it has a household ID and links so you can link those people together. So if you're interested in the effect of one person's employment on another person's employment, that sort of thing, then that's the file for you. Um, but because it's got extra detail in, in that direction, it loses some detail in other directions. There are longitudinal files. Because information is collected from people five times, there are files that hook up people for two consecutive waves, or there are files that contain uh, records where they've, they've linked people over five waves. There's a Eurostat version, so that's the version that contains the classifications that uh, are used by Europe. Uh, there's the annual population survey, which sounds like an entirely different survey, but it's actually uh, the spine of that is the labor force survey, and it's boosted, and then it's produced on an annual basis, but I'll come back to that later. Uh, and there are also versions of the data that are more, uh, more detailed than the ones that you can get under a standard license. So there's a thing called special license, which allows you to get at things like local authority geography, month of birth, um, other bits and bobs, uh, or secure, which is a very controlled uh, lockdown way of accessing data. You have to have be an approved researcher for that. There's a process for doing that. Uh, you're not allowed to download the data. You have to access the data remotely, and your outputs are checked. But what you get in return is things like um, actual date of birth, four-digit codes for industry and occupation, um, and you'll also get things like uh, postcode. So analyzing at the postcode level is probably not a helpful thing to do because of the numbers involved, but it does mean you can do things like uh, request that information be brought on so you can link in postcode related information so you can talk about more about the geographical context in which people live in your analysis. Does mean though that um, one of the first obstacles to get over it is needing to be able to identify which of those files you're likely to want. Uh, I'll show you later that if you go to our series page for the Labour Force Survey, you'll see the whole whole set. 
and um, you can click through those and find out about them. But uh, just recently, uh, the Office for National Statistics have produced a really useful guide. Um, you'll find it in our documentation for the more recent files, and it's a, a guide which is all about what are the characteristics of each of those types of data set, what you might want to use them for. And there's even a handy flow chart at the end uh, to, to help you make the decision. So uh, what I haven't shown you is what the microdata look like. So let's, let's, let's have a quick look at a corner of a microdata set, just so we can be uh, crystal clear about this. So this, uh, if you're doing an analysis, chances are you're going to want to do it in some sort of analysis package. This is what uh, one of the data sets, it's 2011, it's a cut down teaching data set. Um, I guess it's just easier to show you that. Uh, so this is a 2011 cut down version of the labor force survey. It's, we're only showing a corner, it goes on a lot larger, a lot longer in both directions. Um, but what you see is that you've got a matrix of data and in each of the rows you've got an individual respondent and in each of the columns you've got something that varies from respondent to respondent. Uh, so we call those variables uh, because they vary. So uh, this uh, person here, person, the third person, uh, we can see that they're married or cohabiting. So just, just to check that we've all got that, uh, I'm going to ask you how old is the third person? So you have a quick shifty now. And then we will have a look. Yeah, it's looking good so far, apart from folk who, who've forgotten their glasses or uh, are on tiny screens. OK, that's nearly all of you, so if we can wind that up. Okay, right, well, that's, that's reassuring. Um, most of you got that it was between 65 and 69. Uh, uh, few odd answers, um, a few of you who, who weren't able to tell because you just couldn't see the screen clearly enough. But if we, we close that poll and we go back to uh, what the question was. So uh, this third person then, uh, this case knew is an identifier. It, it's not their age. Uh, they are aged, whoops, this row, they are aged 65 to 69, as well as being married and cohabiting, female, white, economically inactive, and so forth. But you can see the, you can see that with data of this sort, what you get is you get a whole range of different characteristics for each person. And that means that you can work with subpopulations of your choice. So, for example, if you wanted to work with just young people, you can do that. You can just select the young people. Or if you wanted to work with uh, NEET, so people who are not in employment, uh, educational training. You can produce tables to your own specification. So if you wanted to uh, work on something like qualifications by ethnicity and there wasn't anything published on that, you can produce the table. Uh, you can rework the data to produce your own definition. So, for example, if you wanted to, instead of NEETS, which is the standard classification, you were concerned about part-time workers, they're not fully engaged. So you wanted to, uh, to, to have NFEET, so people who are not in full-time employment, educational training. Well, you, you can do that. You can identify the people who are not in full-time work, who aren't in employment or in training. So. The other thing that you can do that's really powerful is multivariate analysis. So because you've got a whole range of different, uh, different variables for each individual, you can build an awful lot of different predictors into a statistical model like a, a regression, which means that you could ask questions like how, is, uh, how is, does education level, sex and ethnicity relate to whether or not a young person is employed at age 25. So it's, it's really powerful stuff. Okay, um, I just want to run through some of the key LFS, um, LFS, I keep saying LFS, Labour Force Survey, LFS, um, uh, some of the key data sets, but I'm going to do that as, as quick as I can, because, one, because I've mentioned them, and two, because it, it, it can get quite dull. So the quarterly Labour Force Survey, if you see quarterly Labour Force Survey, then it means that it's designed for analysis, which are individual and at one point in time. 
So it relates to just one quarter and where you're only looking at the individual level. So it's now it's designed to be representative for individual level analysis and, and when I say it's designed to be representative, it doesn't mean that the cases have changed, but as we'll see later, the cases have the data have to be adjusted to make them representative. And and that has been done in this data set so that it can be representative of individuals. The only the other way in which it can be made to be made representative is if you're doing uh, analyses of earnings. So there's also a way of, of looking at earnings and earnings and individuals, um, they're slightly different ways of working because um, the issue is who's going to respond to the questionnaire. So you find that um, people who respond to the questionnaire, there are biases in who's responded and who hasn't responded, which would result in a biased data set overall. But if you then say, well, what about people who've responded to the income question, you find that there are a different set of issues with income than there is for the population as a whole. So um, extra work has to be done for earnings, and if you're working with earnings, then you have to adjust appropriately for earnings, and you can do that using this data set. So the sorts of analysis you might want to do is just asking about the sorts of income that self-employed people are, are bringing in. Uh, top things to know is that the way that you make them representative is by using weights. And uh, income analyses, as I say, require income weights. And I'll, I'll, I'll come back to the weights again later because that may or may not be a, a familiar concept for you. The household labor force survey, on the other hand, is designed if you're looking at households at one point in time. So they've got a few extra household variables in there, but they, they lose a bit of detail on some other things. And it's appropriate if you wanted to ask, say, are there differences between the households of young uh, people who are neat versus young people who are students versus young people who are workers? So you could look at the household characteristics, not just because of the variables that have been put in there about household characteristics, although there are extra variables of that sort, but because you've got the ability to link everyone together and to generate your own household characteristics. So if you wanted to generate a variable that says, is this a workless household, you've got the power to do that, for example. Um, so the, the key things to know about this data type of data is that you have a household ID variable, and it's that household ID variable that will allow you to link household members together. The longitudinal data as I said before, are designed in two-wave or five-wave flavors. So the two-wave flavors, the advantage of that is that the, the longer that people respond, the less likely they are to respond, more people drop out for one or, one or more waves. So if you're just looking, wanting to look at change between uh, this quarter and the next quarter, then just using a, a, a data set that is designed to handle just those people who were in those two quarters is the way to go. But if you want to look across a full full year, then, then the five-wave version is what you want. So it allows you to experience the, um, to look at the, the experiences of individuals and to compare the experiences of those individuals across time. So the sorts of analysis that it might be useful is things like what proportion of unemployed people at time one are also employed a, a year later. That's the sort of thing that you can do with it. Uh, some tips and issues there is that the labor force survey isn't, isn't perfect for this. Um, the reason being that they don't follow individuals when they move house. What they do is they keep going back to the same address and, and then those people are differentiated, but uh, the new people are in the sample. Um, but nevertheless, there's been some methodological work done and, and uh, ONS are, are reasonably content that this stuff is, is fit for purpose. So uh, they're, they're happy to recommend it for the purpose of, of, of working longitudinally. Uh, the other thing to bear in mind is because you're only following people who joined on one particular wave, so one cohort, you're not dealing with as large samples. So you're only dealing with people who joined in a particular quarter, people for whom it's their wave one in that quarter, and then follow them through. So that's worth knowing. I mentioned the annual population survey. This is a good choice if you need a larger sample. Now, uh, the annual population survey takes people over the period of a year who were either in their first wave, their final wave, or who were part of boosts. So what was done was you take the first and the fifth wave, 
for the labour force survey, which is already bigger than the labour force survey. But then to that, you add in extra boosting so that you've got enough cases to be able to produce some, uh, some estimates, statistical estimates for local authorities. So with combining the labour force data and adding in the boost, instead of there being around 100,000 cases, there's more likely to be something like 350,000 cases. So it's, it's a much bigger thing. Of course, it doesn't have the strain, same strength to look at uh, things on a quarterly basis, although when the data come out, they're released quarterly, but it's, it's effectively a quarterly released annual average. Um, and the other thing is, because the boosts don't include quite as many questions, because the Labour Force Survey questionnaire is quite a long one, um, you won't get quite as many questions in there. But if you want to look at some basic uh, labour market stuff and you want big numbers, then this is a really good choice. Um, so the sorts of things that you might want to look at is, is things like whether or not being Muslim affects your experience of the labour market, because in one annual population survey, you've got 12,000 Muslims in there compared with only 4,000 in a quarter of the labour force survey. Okay, uh, so I've, I've given you a bit of a taster of the way in which these data get used and why uh, you've got these different types of flavours, a labour force survey. Um, if you want to uh, see some case studies of actual research that people have been doing with the labour force survey, then you, you, you couldn't really do better than to have a look at our case studies. So the case studies are short accounts of um, research that have been undertaken. There are some labour force survey case studies in there. Um, most of them are based on published research, so you can actually then go back to the published research and see what it looks like in full. Uh, it's searchable by keyword and data set. So um, there's a link there, and if you get that uh, handout of the, the PDF of the slides, you'll have that, that link uh, available to you uh, as, soon as, uh, as soon as we're finished. Um, okay. So uh, quick question then. We can launch that poll. So, uh, if you were interested in whether graduates are more likely than non-graduates to get promoted within any year, uh, which of the files do you think that you'd go for? That's half of you going. Yeah, it is a pop quiz. Check whether you've been paying attention. That's most of you voted, just the last few stragglers. Okay, I think we'll call that quits. Uh, so that's 60% uh, of you gone for the longitudinal 5 wave file. Yeah, if, if I were to ask that question myself, that's certainly where I'd start. So I would begin by looking at whether or not I could do what I needed to do using the longitudinal 5 wave file. Um, if I couldn't do that, then I might start rummaging around to see whether or not there are any questions about what you were doing last year in the other files. But, um, but certainly if I was looking at wanting to understand changes in individuals' experience across a year, then that's, that's where I would start. And if I found that I was ending up with small numbers that were too small, I might consider putting together data from, from two, different, um, two different files. So uh, we can move on. Now, if you're ever reusing data that were collected by somebody else, the big issue is going to be that you, having not collected the data yourself, you're going to have to make a real effort to make sure that you understand what it is that you're dealing with. And that sounds blimmin' obvious, but actually getting it right can involve a fair bit of work. Um, so uh, I want to think a little bit about that. Think a bit about software, think about some of the key issues, and uh, at the end I will point you to some resources that's going to help you with that. Um, so as I said, if you're looking at data of this type, now it, it, is, it is just about possible to do this using something like Excel. Um, Excel was not designed for this type of data. It's got disadvantages over the other, over analysis packages like R, 
SPSS or Stutter uh, because because it doesn't actually uh, bring the labeling, so all the information about what the data mean together as well with the data. So you're going to be just looking at numbers rather than looking at text whilst the, the software deals with numbers. Um, you're going to find that the statistical methods available to you, particularly in things like dealing with weighting, are going to be much better. And as I say, that we are going to face weighting. Um, so the, the, the software that we support and that we have guides for are uh, SPSS, Stata and R. Um, R has got a bit more of a learning curve, but it, it does have the advantage of being free. Um, the other two are more expensive. Um, SPSS, ten, if you're lucky enough to be in an institute of higher education, you may well find that you've got that just on a, a, a site license. Uh, Stata tends to be trickier. Um, they all have their charms. I, I won't go into that in detail, but uh, if anyone's interested, I'm, I'm happy to chat about that at the end. Uh, another thing that's open to you, certainly when you're starting to use the data, is, where, is, is exploring online. So uh, a lot of the labour force survey data is available in this thing called Nestar. So that's an online tool that allows you to uh, look at questions, not always, but often, to look at frequencies. And then if you're registered, to get in, have a, a play around with the data and do some things like producing simple tables, trying out the weighting. So it allows you to do things like I, I decide whether or not you've got enough cases to work with. But it, it's not great for doing a full analysis. Before you start, you really need to get to grips with uh, some of the documentation. You're going to need to understand how the samples were taken. Uh, and really critically, you're going to need to understand the questionnaire. Um, so when you're thinking about the questionnaire, you don't just think about the questions, but you need to ask who is asked what. This is a complex questionnaire, and you're going to find that some questions are applicable to some people and some are not. And the people who it's applicable to are the people that you're going to be producing your analysis for. So you, you need to understand this. So I'm, I've put up a, an example of a, a bit of the questionnaire. Um, this is a really straightforward example. But there's quite a lot of information stashed in here. So uh, the, the question is called 10-1, which says uh, it's about tenure. In which ways do you occupy the accommodation? And then there's a fairly straightforward list of own it outright, buying with the help of mortgage, right down to squatting. This bit here is telling you uh, a bit about what data uh, this turns up in. So it's saying it's across the, e, uh, across the UK. Uh, it's in every quarter. Uh, I think it's us. I'm not terribly sure what that W1 means. It sounds like wave one, but that doesn't fit with this. Oh, wave one people in every quarter. And it's also available in, in an even bigger data set, which um, is getting discontinued, so I, I won't, won't, won't bore you with that one. Uh, it's available in this version of the data, which we don't get our mitts on. That's just the ONS insiders, the government data, which is, again, uh, we, is, is the version that you can get in secure, special license, and in the standard end user license. It applies to everybody in the, question, in the questionnaire. So this is a straightforward one, but you can imagine if you're asking detailed questions about self-employed people, then that's not going to apply to all. And you need to be aware of who, exactly who it's going to apply to. Is it people aged over 16? It's going to be people aged over 16 who are in work. It's going to be people aged over 16 who are out of work. You know, I can continue. So you, you need to get that uh, sorted out. So you need to know who is asked what and how. Be aware that uh, it's not just questions turning into variables. There are also things called derived variables. So uh, something like economic activity isn't the result of a question saying, what economic activity do you have? It's the result of about 20 questions that ask you, bit by bit, were you working last, last week? If you weren't working last week, were you looking for work last week? If you were looking for work last week, were you available to take up work and so forth? So there's a whole batch of questions that are, that, uh, are applicable to some people and not others, depending on what they've previously answered. And then that's put together behind the scenes before the data go out. So these variables that are put together after the data being collected, before it gets to us, those are our derived variables. And for those, you are not going to find them in the questionnaire. What you'll find instead is that there's a, a, a bit of the user guide that explains how uh, these derived variables were created, which allow you to track back to what was asked in the questionnaire. But it, it does take a bit of detective work.
So you're going to need to think about whether or not the concepts that have been captured in these variables are actually what you want to be using, whether it's good enough, and whether or not there's enough cases to be reliable enough. So then that first key issue about working with the data is that you need to get to know your data. Um, so part of it is about documentation, and then part of it is getting into the data and seeing whether it behaves like you think it does, given what you've seen in the documentation. So uh, you may find that you have to restructure the data to get it to work like you want to. You may need to do some deriving yourself. Um, and you may find that some variables have a lot of missings, and they may be don't knows, did not answers, not applicable. They might be gaps in the data. Um, so it might be because uh, questions were asked uh, only for one group. It may be that questions were asked differently for different groups. You need to combine that together. And it may be because it's not valid. So, But all of these things you're going to need to distinguish and understand before you go any further. Okay, second, uh, you're going to have to do some weighting. Now, the reason you're going to have to do some weighting is that without uh, applying the weights, which are these fixes to make the data representative, your results will be biased. So it's not to do with how precise your data, your estimates are going to be. It's going, it, all, of your, all of your estimates will be wrong. And they will be wrong in one direction or another. So there are certain things that are behind that. One is although uh, ONS or NISRO produce these lovely representative samples, some people are more likely to answer than others. So that's one issue you need to take care of. And the response rate now is, 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 is really a long way down from where it was a couple of decades ago. And this is true of all surveys. So even at wave one, the first time people are asked, you only get about two thirds of people saying, yeah, okay, I'll give you my data. So, if you imagine that the people who aren't giving people that aren't giving the data are different from the people who are, then you do get these biases. Um, other things are things like uh, if uh, if the interviewers find a household that's just only contains people aged over 75, they don't go back and interview them a second, fifth time because the, the core purpose of the survey is about employment. Um, so that means that if you don't wait, you're going to have an underrepresentation of the elderly. Okay. So uh, we do have a guide to waiting on our site because we know that this is something that people struggle with. Uh, be aware that in the labor force survey, the weights were not designed for our purpose uh, primarily. They were designed for producing population count estimates. So if you apply the weights and you find that the numbers go from uh, in, the hun in the tens of thousands up to suddenly into the millions, then your software hasn't realized that it's gross in weighting. There's a way of fixing that. Um, it's in our waiting guide, so I won't tell you about it now. So uh, if here's a, an example from uh, the Longitudinal Labour Force Survey. So unweighted, we can see that uh, people who are uh, in employment, there's 45% of them, but actually when the weights have been applied, which is the fix to make the data more representative, more like the population data, more like census data, then actually it jumps up to 53%. So the differences actually can be quite big. Second issue, and this is an issue that is true for all sample data, is that the data are subject to sampling error. Now, whenever you take a sample, uh, the sample is different from another sample you could theoretically take. So there is no definitive sample. Samples may be out a bit in one direction. They might be out a bit in another direction. Fortunately, the ways in which they're out have got statistical features we know about, and we can therefore work out how, how, um, uh, how wide a level of confidence we have. No, that's a terrible way of explaining it. Um, we can say how far away in either direction the true value is likely to be from the value that we're actually getting from our sample. So now, this isn't just true of the data that you get from us, the microdata. The data that you get from NOMIS, the data that are in the published reports, they've all come from the same sample data. So if you see large counts in uh, your NOMIS local area statistics, remember, those are estimates of counts. They're not the true count. And that you'll need to also look at the percentage and what the confidence interval is on that. So if we look at something like, um, I'm in Manchester right now. 
So uh, for 2014, from NOMIS, so this is the, the published figures rather than from the microdata, um, the percentage who were unemployed in 2014 was 11%, but the 95% confidence interval means that you can only be 95% confident that the true value falls 4.4% either side of that. So it could be 7%, it could be 15%. Now, there's a sum for doing that. It's a very standard sum. It's here. I won't go into the details, but um, it, it's their work done. You can look at it on your slides later. Um, but it's worth noting also that this is actually a very naive way of thinking about the confidence intervals in the labor force survey, because in reality, the data are not strictly uh, random as a simple random sample, which is the basis of most statistical assumptions. So most statistical packages, um, most statistics are based on simple random samples. In reality, uh, you don't get them very often. Uh, for the standard data sets, you're not going to have the full information about how the sample was collected to allow you to fix that up. But there is a bit of information in the documentation about a thing called the DEF. Now, the DEF is the effect of the sampling over and above this just general business about it being a sample in the first place. So it's the, the effect of the sampling being different from a simple random sample, if, if that means anything to you. And you ought to multiply it by that. So the amount to which this number will be out will vary. Uh, there's a little bit of guidance in the documentation, but you're probably going to be stuck with uh, using this naive version of working out how accurate your estimates are, and then just be aware that, 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 there's, that, that you need to allow for that to actually be wrong. Okay, so in that last situation, I'm going to go back just so you can see it. Um, last situation, this is for a subsample. Uh, I've got to know which subsample it is, but let's say um, it's Afro-Caribbean young people in a particular region. So we've, we've only got in the sample 140 of them, which means that our estimates uh, could be 9% either way, which is a really big range, so it's a lot of uncertainty. You can imagine that if you wanted to, to make a claim difference between two groups, you can have problems claiming difference. If, if you think actually it could be 10%, you know, 9% higher than this, it could be 9% lower than this. So if, if you were in that boat, um, what could we do to increase that sample size to make it more accurate? Okay, well, this, this one's obviously harder. They haven't to think hard about this one, but that's about two thirds of it. Okay, let's call that quits. Okay, um, so I'm seeing oh, a, a bang on split between the annual population survey and combining lots of quarters. Um, I think the official ONS answer would be consider switching to the annual population survey. So if the annual population survey will do what you need it to do, then it has been designed for purpose. Now, combining lots of quarters together is uh, a good idea in principle. But remember, we've got this sample that has been designed with people being interviewed quarter after quarter five times. So and the way that the data have been set up is to fix it up so that it's representative if we use the data in that form. If you combine lots of quarters together, you're going to have to deal with two problems. The first is that, uh, that you may have the same people in the same in, in neighboring quarters. So those cases are not independent of each other, and that un will undermine a lot of statistical assumptions. The other is that the weighting uh, the weighting will be problematic. Um, so if we were say, to say, well, we'll do what they do in the annual, uh, annual population survey, we'll take the first and the fifth wave uh, and we'll combine four quarters together. Uh, but that's okay because you don't have people overlapping, which is why the annual population survey does it the way that they do. But then you're going to have the problem that the weights have not been designed to support that. So um, it's a good way to go if you're, you're super good at weights or if, if you're willing to, to, to risk the weights being wrong. Okay, um, I'm aware that I've been talking a long time, and I, I did want to show you a couple of things. Um, 
So I'm just going to say very briefly, because uh, you have the, the slides, uh, that if you want information on things like waiting, or how to use Nestar, how to use software, how to restructure data files, then we have got guides on that if you go into our use data section on our website. If you hit problems, uh, particularly if you find that the data don't look right, if there are things that appear to be missing or things that appear to be wrong, do get in touch with us. Uh, there's a link to help on each of our web pages, uh, and we'll do the best we can. Um, there's also a, a bunch of ways uh, to uh, a bunch of ways to keep in touch with us. Um, now I'm, I'm going to I'm going to do very limited. I'm just going to quickly show you where to find this stuff on our website. Um, I won't. Um, I think you think you you seem to be fairly good on methods, um, so I'm not going to show you it in SPSS unless somebody asks me to do so. But I will I will just show you on our website where you can find this stuff. So, so uh, just so I can point you in the direction of the quickest way to get into this, by far the quickest way, if you're specifically interested in the labor force survey, the quickest way to go in is to go get data, key data, and uh, the default page is UK surveys, which is very convenient for you. And you'll find Labour Force Survey is just listed on that page. This is the series page, so this is information about all of the Labour Force surveys. And I said this is where you would see all of those flavours of the Labour Force sitting together. The top one, um, I sort of wish wasn't the top anymore, um, because it, it's the old version. So before it, the data were quarterly, they were annual. Before they were annual, they were biennial. Um, so going all the way back to the 1970s when they were working out how to do this, they were only doing it every other year. So um, that's the old school Labour Force Survey. Quarterly Labour Force Survey is the one that most people use. It's, uh, it's the one for individual level analysis and for income and level analysis and so forth. There's some uh, general getting started information, some frequently asked questions. But uh, to get into it, you'd go into, say, the Quarterly Labour Force Survey. Clicking on that, you get to the catalogue record, which has got information about that specific survey. Really important at the bottom is all of that lovely documentation that ONS produce. Be aware that ONS produce one-size-fits-all documentation. So if you're using uh, the household, uh, household file, it'll be the same documentation as the individual file. So you need to pay close attention to what, what relates to the exact file that you're doing. Don't assume that it all relates. So that's really useful. Uh, and uh, you can then download the data. To do that, you need to be registered. Or you can access it online and start drilling down and finding out more about about the actual variables. I hope it's useful, um, and uh, I hope that you'll use the data. So I think at that point I'll, I'll say goodbye. I wish you all a lot of luck. <laughs>